keep talking about a lot about this COVID-19 and the biomarkers. What was the need of biomarkers? See, when we started with COVID-19, we thought it will be a very small thing, something like the, uh, you know, which we had the H1N1 and all that. We didn't know that it would just take the world by a storm, which is eventually what it did. So the need of biomarkers arose, and I had attended a meeting which was done by the Chinese somewhere in the March, April from the Wuhan University, and they had started talking a lot of the use of biomarkers in the treatment and the prophylaxis, how one would follow uh, patients with that. So what this is what about the Wuhan vi virus or the COVID-19 virus, and this is its actual structure, you know, what it looks like with this uh, hairy things. And uh, this is how it differs a bit from the other viruses which have been coming. So the process is just the same. The, the, you inhale the virus, the virus gets detected, then you have the T uh, recruited T cells, and then you have the SARS-CoV-2. The problem with this one is that it is a multi-organ. Once it comes down, it just affects each and every organ, and it can be a disaster when it comes to the storm. And therefore, you need to pick it up very early. Early stages, what we were all doing was we were seeing this, it has been detected, we would isolate, and many of the patients were being put in the hospitals, being put in the ventilators, which eventually we realized that that was not the right way to go. But see, till then, nobody knew how to treat it. So this was a result which came that if it was not managed well, you had the cytokine storm, led to clotting, led to shock, lung injury, cell death, immune uh, paralysis and renal failure, which led to inflammation, organ failure and infection, ultimately leading to the death of the patient. And hence, this, uh, the other paramedical, I mean, the other uh, laboratory, as well as the radiological markers starting apparent, and then we started understanding how this disease actually processes. So this is just about the cytokine storm syndromes. And that is when we realized, like Dr. Pranav was saying, the biological markers which we required. We all knew procalcitonin. We all knew that procalcitonin helped us in detecting difference between a bacterial, um, you know, uh, sepsis and all that. But what we did not realize was that this is going to be such an important marker uh, where it is going to be in the progress of this disease of COVID-19. So here, these are the normal ones which we have. So I think somebody was asking, may have asked this biological markers in asymptomatic, in the viral phase, what do you get? So normal routine lab, you'll get mild lymphocytosis, normal blood gas. So this is how it is actually going to proceed and actually goes up. And what are the tests which we are going to do? In the severe cases, as you can see, there is increase of D-dimer and ferritin, and then there will be uh, all the other markers, including CRP, as he was telling, and we will also be doing NT pro BNP, and the severe elevation of inflammatory markers will lead to that phase. So that is a critical uh, response which will be coming out. What are the biomarkers which we thought were of very much uh, high use? Well, fever is not a biomarker, but it is an indication. Leukocytosis, cytokines, CRP, and procalcitonin is what we picked up. And when you look at procalcitonin, it's uh, specific for infection. It is not sensitive to very much sensitive to inflammation, but its advantages were that it was very specific. It has a rapid induction within six to 12 hours, and it correlates quite well with severity of infection. In fact, in the one which Dr. Pranav also showed, there is also a decrease in the procalcitonin happening to his second patient, uh, which he had seen. It does show a slight increase, but it is also showing a decrease in the other one. However, fever and leukocytosis, as it is, they're very simple tests, which can easily be done, inexpensive, while as procalcitonin, I think IL-6 are concerned, they're slightly more on the expensive side. So what is this procalcitonin? I mean, we can see what it all this is usually produced from the thyroid C cells. And there is a history to it. I won't go over it. The history is all available uh, for anyone to see. The early days... So they discovered that in toxic shock, it does increase. It has a relation in sepsis. It has a relation of in continuing of PCT levels in uh, non-infectious stimulus also increases. And uh, even it has produced extra thyroid. Precursor of uh, calcitonin, what we really realized is that in healthy individuals, it is usually not detected. It does increase in bacterial infection and as far as viral infection is concerned, the PCT gets inhibited in response to variety viral infections. So actually it gets uh, attenuated in viral infection. 
So this is our biomarker, procalcitonin. Basically, as I said, we were using it to differentiate between bacterial and virus, and it gives a good response to bacterial load. This is the stage which is showing the production. The normal range, normal ranges are what we always talk about. So normal range of procalcitonin level in blood, we would see these are the ranges which are concerned. And severe uh, sepsis, we will understand when it's more than 10 micrograms per liter. And I think now we are measuring in the hospitals, if it is less than 0 0.5, they say there is a low risk of sepsis. Anything about 0 0.5, which is going up for patients who are now with COVID, uh, they are worrying about possible sepsis or there is going to be an increase. So this is the point at which there is a turning point which is happening and the worry starts at that level. What we really notice about it, that levels will change very rapidly in response to a bacterial infection. And uh, within two to three hours, you can see an increase. The levels will then rise rapidly. We will reach a plateau and on treatment, if the treatment is good enough and uh, accurate, you find the levels coming down also. So this is the similar graph which is showing the same thing. If the pathogen is not contained, the infection will spread and the body upregulates his pro-inflammatory mediators. As I said again, it shows a very rapid response to treatment of bacterial infection. Bacteremia with response to treatment will show a very good response. Without response to treatment, it will again increase. Severe sepsis can be very dangerous. And without treatment, as you can look at the graph on the other side, you can see how, uh, how much it is the uh, response is in increasing. So what we really mean to say is if treated on time, uh, we could be able to take care and this is one of the good markers. How do we advise? We advise that uh, if the person, so this is the learnings which have come over a period of time, you need to do the procalcitonin level on admission. We need to test the PCT is an aid for early risk assessment. And if they are high risk patients, patients who are, you know, will have comorbidities or all that, you need to measure the lab 0.5. And there is a, for this, if this is the level, then there is a low risk for bacterial co-infection. If it is above 0.5, which we are saying, these are high risk uh, patients and bacterial co-infection is regular and likely. So the PCTA needs to be done as soon as we admit the patient. And nowadays we are not admitting the patients so much if they are having a very low uh, levels as it is, they were isolating home. But in the early stages we were admitted, which may have been something which you were not doing right either. So if it is home isolation, still you can keep a watch by various methods, but if it is admission, a PCT is advised. During the hospital stay, what will you do? So during the hospital day, you will monitor the PCT levels to detect secondary infections and progression of the severity of the bacterial infection. Majority of the people with mild disease had values between uh, 0 0.25 or even maybe less than 0 0.1. And uh, if you started finding the levels rising, then there is a likelihood of bacterial infection. And we need to start recommendation to start antibiotics with patients who have got a higher level. So what is the clinical impact? So it is helping in bacterial infection. It differentiates, as we know, between bacterial and viral infection. Advantage, it is rapid response to infection. And these are the studies which have shown the antibiotics which we can use. Uh, we have already mentioned this. It has greater sensitivity and specificity than other markers of inflammation. Dr. Pranav, this is as you said, but, but here they are mentioning CRP also, and of course IL-6. As you can see, this was another one when we did the H1N1 influenza pandemic when it came. And this is just one graph which is showing that in viral infections, you don't see the elevation at all. When it is a bacterial infection, there is a elevation of uh, procalcitonin happening. And in this case, which is resulting very, it goes into a bacterial infection because it suppresses the immune system. Uh, the PCT monitoring is a must. So this is just in case people have been interested on when do you monitor and how do you monitor. So when should you give an antibiotic? When should you discourage an antibiotic? And when should you strongly discourage? So as I said, if it's a local, you need not worry. But if the sepsis and the values are rising high, then we need to strongly advocate the use of antibiotics. Of course, 
There are inclusion criteria. I won't go into this. And when we talk about CDC, we realize that it has put PCT among a list of inflammatory markers correlating to the severity of illness. It is typically normal on admission, but it may increase among those admitted to the ICU. Patients with critical illness have very high levels, suggesting potential immune dysregulation. So they have endorsed the use of a low value in the course of confirmed COVID-19 illness due to guide the withholding or early stopping of antibiotics, especially with patients who have got less severe disease. The limitations are always there for every test. So limitations are it is more expensive. There is a turnaround time, which is dependent on the lab processes. Nowadays, I think we don't have, we are giving the results very fast because we have understood and the volume has gone up. Uh, sometimes it may require serial determinations and it can have causes other than the bacterial infection. There is always an optimal cutoff. Pitfalls. There are other areas in which the PCT elevations may rise even due to a non-bacterial cause. For example, a newborn, if there is a massive stress, if there are treatments with agents which stimulate cytokines, uh, that is also there. If it is a coexistence, so in our country, it is never always not possible that the person cannot have a correlated or coexisting disease also. So there could always be malaria with this or some fungal infections. And in cases of prolonged severe cardiogenic shock or organ perfusion abnormalities. There have been various uh, treatment charts which we have done. Uh, how would we go ahead for it? For if it's epidemiological surveillance, you do RT-PCR, you start with anti-SARS, COVID-2. Like Dr. Nile said, there is antibody assays now. For diagnostic, we have only RT-PCR. And for biochemical monitoring, we do lymphocyte count, CRP, interleukin, and calcitonin. What is the take-home message which I would give everyone? The take-home message we would suggest is PTS, PCT testing on admission seems to be a valuable additional piece of information to aid in early risk assessment and rule out of the bacterial co-infection in COVID-19 patients. Monitoring is very, it has been identified to be useful for detection of secondary infections and progression to more severe disease state like sepsis and septic shock. Thank you very much.